I stood in the dim back room of the trading post in 1993, the pungent smell of old leather and dust heavy in the air. This place, tucked amidst the rolling hills of the Navajo Nation Reservation, was a lifeline to many of us. It was also a place where gossip and stories flowed as freely as the meager water supply. Name's Joshua Treehorn, I told the stout woman behind the counter. I'm looking for work. Anything at all. She sized me up, her gaze lingering on my worn boots and faded jeans. You any good with a horse, Mr. Treehorn? One of the best, I assured her, though it had been years since I'd sat in a saddle. I needed this, needed anything to get back on my feet. Life on the reservation was tough, but it was home. I got a fellow who might take you on, but he's particular, can't handle the quiet. She gave me a skeptical look. You a talker? A ghost of a smile crossed my lips. I've been known to spin a yarn or two. That did it. A flicker of amusement crossed her face. She scribbled an address on a crumpled receipt. Head north towards the ship rock. He's about ten miles out. Big old white ranch house. Got a horse barn behind it. Name's Walter Duncan. Tell him Loretta sent you. Walter Duncan, if the gossip was to be believed, was about as crazy as a coyote with a mouthful of cactus. Lived alone, kept to himself, talked to the horses more than to people, some said. Perfect. I found the ranch as the sun began to dip below the horizon. It was a sprawling affair, more land than any one man on his own would need. As I pulled my old truck up the gravel drive, I felt a prickle of unease. The horses, and there were dozens, grazed restlessly, their eyes wide and wary. Even the air seemed charged, heavy with an unspoken tension. The house loomed ahead. Walter Duncan stood on the porch, a silhouette against the fading light. He was tall, lean as a fence post, and even from a distance, I could sense a raw energy radiating from him. Mr. Duncan? I approached him cautiously. Loretta at the trading post sent me. I'm here about the work. He turned, his gaze cold and assessing. Treehorn, is it? Come on inside, then. He didn't offer his hand to shake. The inside of the ranch house was as peculiar as its owner. Dusty taxidermy lined the walls, staring with unseeing eyes. The air hummed with a low, persistent buzz I couldn't place. Walter pointed to a worn armchair and gestured for me to sit. He didn't beat around the bush. Tell me, Treehorn, you believe in things you can't see? I shrugged. The old stories? Some truth in them, I suppose. Spirits? Skinwalkers, maybe? His eyes narrowed. Not stories. Things out there in the darkness. Things that don't follow the rules. He started to pace, his voice taut with a nervous energy. Something's been at my herd. Killing horses. Not for food. For sport, almost seems. He finally stopped, fixing me with a piercing stare. The thing out there, it's not right. Not natural. My heart thudded in my chest. This was why folks kept their distance. Walter Duncan wasn't just odd. He was touched, as the elders would say. Look, I said cautiously. Whatever's bothering your horses, maybe it's a mountain lion. Maybe coyotes got too big for their britches. I'm a decent enough tracker. Can help you find it, put it down but he wasn't listening. His focus had shifted, his gaze fixated on a point over my shoulder. Following it, my blood ran cold. There, framed in the doorway leading to the kitchen, stood the largest, blackest dog I'd ever seen. Its eyes burned like embers, and a low growl rumbled in its chest. But what froze me in place was the shape of it, the way it moved, wrong somehow. You see it, don't you? Walter's voice was a hoarse whisper. It's here. Right now. I nodded, unable to speak. Every instinct told me to run, but some deep, stubborn part of me, a part that echoed with the old stories of my ancestors, kept me rooted in place. The dog thing took a step forward, its guttural growl escalating. It didn't move like an ordinary dog, its limbs too long, its body contorted in impossible angles. Walter reached under an end table, pulling out an old lever-action rifle. Can you shoot? His voice was eerily calm. You bet, I said, my own voice steadier than I felt. 
Then we might just survive the night, he said grimly, raising the rifle. Thing is, bullets might not be enough. I took a steadying breath. I didn't know if I believed in monsters, but I believed in what I was seeing. And something told me this wouldn't be some simple hunt. The dog thing snarled and lunged, a blur of darkness and teeth. Walter fired, the sound deafening in the enclosed room. The creature staggered, but didn't fall. It let out an unearthly howl, a sound that scratched at my sanity. And then it was upon us. The creature moved with impossible speed, dodging Walter's frantic shots. It leapt onto the kitchen table, sending dishes crashing to the floor. I swung my rifle, desperately trying to get a clean shot, the acrid smell of gunpowder filling my nose. The room was a maelstrom snapping teeth, flying fur, and the sickening copper scent of blood. Walter stumbled, the dog thing slashing at his legs. He cried out, the rifle clattering to the floor. It was on him in an instant, its weight crushing him. I charged forward, swinging my rifle like a club. I smashed it against the creature's ribs, felt the bone crack, heard its howl cut short. It whirled, snapping at my face. I jumped back, barely avoiding its jaws as Walter scrambled to his feet. Joshua behind the couch, he barked. I dove for cover just as the creature pounced, its claws ripping through the faded upholstery. We couldn't keep this up. It was too fast, too strong. Walter, I shouted, my voice catching in my throat. This thing, it ain't like nothing I ever seen. He scrambled over to me, his face streaked with blood. I know, he gasped. But remember the stories. Remember what they used to call them? My mind raced through the half-remembered tales my grandmother used to whisper. Stories of shadow things, monstrous creatures born of dark magic. The adversary, I breathed, the old Navajo name rising to my lips, a shiver running down my spine. Walter nodded grimly. They're real, and killable only by fire, so the stories say. My gaze snapped to the fireplace, an ember glowing dimly in the hearth. But we ain't got... matches. Walter pulled a box from his pocket. Old habit. He tossed me the matches and hefted the rifle. Go for the fire, Joshua. I'll keep it busy. My heart hammered like it wanted to escape my chest, but I knew there was no other way. Each second counted. Walter unleashed a shot, and the creature snarled, its attention diverting for just a moment. I sprinted across the room, my boots slipping on the blood-stained tile. I fumbled with the matches, hands shaking. The fireplace seemed miles away. Behind me, I heard Walter grunt, the thud of bodies colliding with furniture. He wouldn't last long. I struck a match, the flame flickering weakly. Come on, come on, I muttered, praying to any spirits that might be listening as I lit the kindling. It caught with a whooshing sound, and I threw another match into the growing flames. Suddenly, the creature was in front of me, its bloodshot eyes blazing. I scrambled backwards, fear seizing me. It lunged. I barely had time to raise an arm, and then I was engulfed in agonizing heat and blinding light. When I could see again, Walter was beside me, pulling me to my feet. The creature thrashed in the heart of the fire, its unearthly howls echoing through the ransacked house. Flames devoured its inky fur, consuming its monstrous form until finally, mercifully, it stilled. We stood there, coughing and trembling, as the flames died down, leaving nothing but ash in their wake. Walter leaned heavily against the mantelpiece, surveying the damage. I didn't know what to say, my mind reeling. Well, he coughed, that's one way to get rid of a pest problem. There was a hint of grim humor in his voice, but it faded as he turned to me, his voice softening. You all right, Joshua? I took a shaky breath. Think so. Reckon I owe you my life. And I owe you mine. Come daybreak, we'll clean this mess up, find new horses. This place won't hold ghosts for long. He patted my shoulder. You've got the heart of a warrior, Joshua Treehorn. I didn't feel like a warrior, but the adrenaline was fading, leaving exhaustion in its wake. As we began the grim work of clearing the wreckage, 
I couldn't help but wonder what other shadows lurked in the vastness of the reservation. What other battles might lay in wait? The sun was just beginning to paint the eastern sky with the promise of dawn as we stepped outside, the cool air soothing our battered skin. Walter's horses stood trembling in a far corner of the pasture, and even in the dim light there was a new alertness in their eyes. The night's horrors slowly receded as we walked towards them. There was work to be done, a life to be rebuilt. I looked out at the sprawling land, this place that held both beauty and darkness, and a resolute strength rose within me. I was Joshua Treehorn, and this was my home. I'd faced an adversary and lived to tell the tale, and whatever else came my way, I'd face that too. The year was 2008, and I was working the night shift as a security guard at a remote research station up in the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. Kind of like those outposts you see in sci-fi movies, but instead of hunting aliens, these guys were studying climate change and whatnot. My name's Henry Little Bear. Grew up on the Yakima Reservation, did a few tours in the Marines, and drifted into security work when I got out. The pay was decent and I figured keeping tabs on a bunch of brainiacs couldn't be that difficult. Evenings were mostly quiet, checking security cameras, walking the perimeter, that kind of stuff. The only excitement I ever got was when the odd critter triggered a motion sensor. One crisp October night, things started to get weird. I was doing my rounds when I noticed one of the outbuildings, a storage shed used for old gear, was unlocked. Strange. I was sure I'd locked it just an hour before. Maybe one of the scientists had needed something, forgot to shut it. I shrugged, pulled out my flashlight and cautiously approached the shed. Inside it was a mess, shelves overturned, tools scattered across the floor like somebody had gone through it in a hurry. Frowning, I stepped over the debris to get a closer look. That's when I saw the blood. A whole lot of it. Splashes on the floor, streaks leading out the other door. My heart started to pound. Something wasn't right here. I radioed to the main facility, my voice tight. Something's happened at Storage Shed 3. Looks like there might have been an accident. They patched me through to the head of security, who sounded less than pleased to be woken up. He told me to wait for backup, to not touch anything. Great like that was comforting. With nothing else to do, I cautiously followed the blood trail. It led out into the woods, away from the facility. I figured this was now a job for the police, but something kept me going. There was a part of me, maybe that old marine instinct, that knew somebody out there might need help. The deeper I got into the woods, the darker it became. The blood trail was getting harder to follow. I reached for my flashlight just as a twig snapped behind me. I whirled around, my heart pounding in my chest. The forest was silent. Probably just a deer, I told myself. Still, the hairs on the back of my neck were standing up. I continued forward, my footsteps muffled by the damp fallen leaves. The blood trail led me to a small clearing, and that's when I saw it. Crouched in the clearing, partially obscured by the shadows, was a massive creature, bigger than any bear I'd ever encountered, its fur ragged and patchy in the moonlight. Its posture was all wrong, limbs impossibly long, and its muzzle. It was like a wolf's, but something wasn't right. Too long, the teeth glistening unnaturally. Beside the creature lay the body of one of the scientists, a young woman I'd seen around the facility named Claire. My stomach turned, rage surged through me. I should have listened to my instincts, called for help when I had the chance. Claire might still be alive. The creature was hunched over its prey, tearing into the body. I swallowed back the fear and raised my sidearm. I'd never had to shoot at anything other than paper targets before. But it was either this creature or me. My first shot echoed through the trees, hitting the creature in the shoulder. It roared, a blood-curdling sound that sent shivers down my spine. The creature reared up taller than me, and then charged. 
I fired again and again, the recoil jolting my arm. The creature stumbled, but it kept coming. Terror flooded through me. I was out of ammo. I turned and ran, scrambling through the underbrush. The creature was gaining, its ragged breaths almost in my ears. Behind me, I could hear it crashing through the trees. Up ahead I saw a drop-off, a ravine leading down to the river. It was my only chance. I took a desperate leap. The ground rushed up to meet me. I hit the slope of the ravine hard and tumbled, my body battered by rocks and branches. I landed with a sickening thud at the bottom, the frigid river just a few feet away. Groaning, I tried to move, but a wave of pain washed over me. I'd broken something, leg or ribs, maybe both. Lying there helpless, I listened. There was no sign of the creature. Maybe it hadn't followed me, or maybe it was just circling above, waiting for me to die. I forced myself to crawl towards the river. Aching and battered, I managed to scoop up handfuls of the icy water and splash it on my face. The shock of it helped me focus. Dying out here wasn't an option. I looked back up the ravine. Climbing it was impossible, not in my condition. The river was my only way out. The water was freezing, but I figured the current would carry me downstream, where hopefully I'd find a road or signs of civilization. Mustering what little strength I had left, I dragged myself into the knee-deep water and let the current take me. The cold was excruciating, but the pain helped keep me conscious. The river twisted and turned, and I lost all sense of time. My vision blurred, but I clung to a desperate hope that help was waiting just around the next bend. Hours later, the sun started to break through the trees. I was beyond shivering, my body going numb. There was a roaring in my ears, and blackness started creeping in at the edges of my vision. And then, I saw it. A bridge. With a final burst of adrenaline, I fought against the current, struggling towards the bank. I reached out, my fingers scraping against rough wood. I fumbled for a grip and managed to pull myself to safety, collapsing on the muddy riverbank. A truck rumbled over the bridge just as everything went dark. I woke up in a hospital bed days later. The doctor told me some hikers found me unconscious under the bridge, suffering from hypothermia and a broken leg in several places. I told him about the creature, about Claire, but he gave me a sad smile, the same look you reserve for crazy people. The police investigated, of course. Search and rescue scoured the woods, but there was no sign of Claire's body or any creature matching my description. They wrote it off as a bear attack I somehow miraculously survived, or maybe just a bad case of hallucinations. I was released after weeks of physical therapy. I never went back to that research station. Found a different line of work. Tried to put it all behind me. It's been years, but I haven't forgotten. Sometimes late at night I wake in a cold sweat and think I hear something scratching at my window. During those sleepless hours... I tell myself that what I saw that night was impossible, a figment of my imagination fueled by terror and shock. But then again, part of me wonders. The wild places are vast and full of mysteries. Old stories get passed down for a reason, even those that sound like monster tales. And if creatures like the one I saw, creatures the scientists would call cryptids, exist on the fringes of our world, well... Let's just say I sleep with a gun under my pillow now. Maybe the truth is that some old stories, the ones about skinwalkers and other shape-shifting shadow-dwelling creatures, are based on something horrifyingly real, something we might never fully understand, something that reminds us that even in this modern world, the wilderness still holds secrets, and some secrets have very sharp teeth. I started on the trails of Custer State Park in the summer of 1978. It was a hobby I kept from my days in the service, finding a piece of the wild and just losing myself in it. My name is Elias Talltrees, and I've always had a strange connection to nature. Maybe it's my Lakota heritage, 
but there were times walking those trails when I felt far less alone than I should have. That day in 78, I left camp in the early morning, just as the sun started painting streaks across the sky. The forecast called for clear weather, the kind that made you want to lie back in the grass and soak in every last ray. My path curled through the dense forestry of the park, winding past streams, over ridges, and across meadows. The deeper I ventured, the lighter the trail markers became. I knew those trails by heart, though. No need to worry about losing my way. By afternoon I was hours deep, my legs burning, the sun scorching down on me. It was time to head back, but the allure of the park was always hard to resist when I was out there. Just a little farther, I told myself. There was just something about that part of Custer. It pulled you in like the whisper of a secret. The trail took a turn and opened into a hidden clearing, a circle of lush green grass walled off by towering pine trees. In the center of it all stood the most spectacular oak tree I'd ever seen. It didn't just rise, it stretched, thick limbs clawing at the sky like the twisted fingers of a giant. I stopped something stirring a sense of unease deep within. I was exposed out there, a stark figure against the green and brown. But something called to me from those woods, a whisper urging me toward the ancient oak. My fingers traced the carvings in my necklace, a gift from my grandmother. Then I started forward. There was something out there in the trees. The moment I stepped foot into the clearing, the air around me turned heavy. It clung to my skin like a damp, oppressive blanket. I heard a rustling behind me. Whirling around, I saw the overgrown pathway had completely vanished, leaving only a solid wall of green. My heart pounded in my ears as I scanned for any trace of the trail. It was like it had never even existed. Sweat trickled down my temple. I had to stay calm. This was just some weird trick of the light, some natural phenomenon I didn't understand. I took a deep breath and turned to the enormous oak, determined to put all this nonsense out of my mind. Then I saw it. Clinging to the thick trunk of the tree was a grotesque figure. Its limbs were far too long, far too thin, ending in knotty claw-like hands. Its head, disproportionately large, was twisted at an unnatural angle, eyes sunken and hungry, focusing on me with a predatory gleam. The creature's skin, if you could call it that, was taut, translucent, revealing the bones and organs writhing underneath. I froze, unsure if I was even breathing. It didn't make a sound, simply hung there, observing me. It didn't need to speak. Its intentions were clear in the malice of its gaze. Terror surged through me then, the primal part of my brain screaming at me to run. I couldn't. My legs refused to respond. The tree groaned as the creature began to move. It was impossibly fast, skittering down the trunk like a spider. One long, bony finger pointed right at me, and my stomach lurched. In that moment, something shifted inside me. All the fear evaporated, replaced by a strange sensation, a calm sense of purpose. There was a reason I was drawn out here, a reason this thing waited for me. My eyes found a fallen branch, a heavy length of weathered wood. I snatched it up, the rough texture grounding me back into reality. The creature was closing in, its movements jerky and unpredictable. Each creak of its joints sent fresh chills down my spine. I screamed, more of a war cry than a sound of terror, and charged, my makeshift weapon raised. The clearing erupted in chaos. The creature moved with unnatural speed, contorting its body dodging my wild swings. I barely registered the sting of its claws grazing my arm. Fueled by a mix of desperation and a primal energy I didn't understand, I kept swinging, fueled by a sudden certainty that I could actually hurt this thing. Its screeches echoed in the trees, rising and falling in pitch. The sound pierced through me, but with each blow I landed, the creature flinched, its cries growing weaker. I don't know how long we fought, time seemed to lose meaning in that place. But gradually, the creature's movements began to slow, its long body racked with what seemed like convulsions. Finally, with a final groan of wood, 
I slammed my makeshift club against its head. The force was enough to send it reeling. The creature thrashed on the ground, then abruptly went still. All that remained was a puddle of viscous black bile seeping into the soil beneath the great oak. I stumbled backward, my chest heaving, heart pounding in my ears. I'd won, but I had barely begun to process what happened when a new sound cut through the air. Voices, shouting, getting closer. Rangers. They must have heard the commotion. My knees gave out and I collapsed onto the forest floor, my head spinning. When the rangers reached the clearing, I couldn't even stand. The adrenaline high wearing off, all I could manage was to point to the spot where the creature had fallen, mumbling incoherently. They found nothing. No blood, no bile, no evidence that any struggle had taken place. The lead ranger, a gruff old man named Jim, eyed me with thinly veiled suspicion. Tall trees, you've been out here alone too long. The sun, it messes with your head, he said, shaking his head. I could almost agree with him as they helped me back to camp. It felt like a fever dream, the kind you desperately try to cling to, only to have it dissolve through your fingers. The look in Jim's eyes told me the story. A crazy old Indian claiming he fought a monster in the woods. That would follow me around for years to come. The only proof I had left was the set of gashes running along my arm and the strange, lingering certainty that even though they couldn't see it, the fight had been real. And what's more, I wasn't the only one out there in those woods. In the months that followed, the event in the clearing haunted me. The rangers insisted it was exhaustion, a heat-induced hallucination, but I knew better. Evenings found me sitting on the worn steps of my cabin, staring out at the vast Lakota reservation, the shadows stretching under the moonlight. The woods held a different feel now, a darkness that seemed to whisper my name. For a time I tried to suppress those memories, to return to my quiet life on the reservation. I reconnected with old friends, joined in community events, even managed to crack a smile here and there. But inside, something had changed. Sleep never came easy, my nights plagued by dreams where I ran through the forest, the skeletal creature always a few steps behind. Then came the news. From a neighboring reservation, a young woman vanished during a hike on a familiar trail. The search turned up nothing, leaving the community shaken. And deep down, I knew that wasn't the end. Something was out there, preying on us. A week later, a rancher was found dead at the far edge of his property, cattle mutilated in some gruesome way. This, coupled with a growing number of missing persons reports across the region, fueled a sense of dread across the reservations. This thing, whatever it was, wasn't stopping. People started whispering about old legends. My grandmother told the tale of the Nagi Tanka, a dark forest spirit that strayed from the path, consumed by a thirst for the living. That name clung to my mind, a grim answer. Then one night, in a burst of desperation, I retrieved an old trunk from the attic. It had belonged to my grandfather, a medicine man. Inside was a mixture of herbs, animal bones, and ritualistic items. A part of me hesitated, knowing it crossed a line I'd never dared approach before. There were old ways, knowledge passed down through generations, that I had mostly dismissed as superstition, but desperate times. Hours later, under the dim glow of the moon, I stood on the outskirts of the forest. Smoke curled from a small clay bowl as I chanted the words taught to me in my youth, half-forgotten prayers to the spirits of the land. I felt a surge of energy flow through me, fear mingled with a grim determination. I wasn't sure if this was madness or my only chance, but I had to try. I moved into the woods, my senses heightened. Each rustle of leaves had my heart racing. Night passed into dawn, yet I found no sign of the creature. The sun cast long, strange shadows through the thicket, playing tricks on my eyes. Still, a nagging feeling told me the thing was watching every move I made, testing me. 
The day wore on. The forest grew dense and confusing, the light filtering through the leaves making everything seem distorted. I was losing hope. That's when I saw it. A flash of movement in the corner of my vision. It was just across a small ravine crouched beside a fallen log. The Nagi Tanka, its form was even more sickening up close, skin stretched tight over protruding bones, a hollow mouth stretched in a permanent, sinister grin. It was larger than I remembered, its eyes reflecting the sunlight like glowing embers. I didn't hesitate. I ran not out of fear, but towards it. Rage bubbled inside me, a mix of grief for those lost and a desperate need to end this. Reaching the ravine, I leapt with a scream, the makeshift weapon I'd crafted raised high. The impact sent us both tumbling into the gully. We grappled, rolls of dead leaves clinging to damp earth. My blows landed with dull thuds. For a moment, I swear I saw something flash in those sunken eyes. A flicker of surprise, maybe even fear. We wrestled in the dirt, the Nagi Tanka surprisingly strong under its wiry frame. Its limbs whipped with unnatural speed, clawed fingers slashing at me. I dodged a swipe that would have ripped my face open, and the thing staggered. Finally, an opening. I lunged, catching it across the chest with my crafted weapon. The wood snapped, the sharp end burying itself in that papery skin. It screeched, a sound that made my bones vibrate. The creature thrashed under me, but I kept my hold, the broken wood digging in deeper. Then abruptly it went limp, the malevolent light dying from its eyes. A foul odor filled the air. I don't know how long I sat there, my breath heaving in my chest, blood mixing with the damp earth. Weariness washed over me, wave after wave. Finally, I stirred. It was time to end this nightmare. Gathering what remained of my strength, I lifted the creature's body, a grotesque echo of life, and began the long trek back out of the woods. News of the creature's death reverberated through the reservations. At first, there was skepticism, quickly silenced when I brought the rotting carcass to the Council of Elders. Its presence filled the meeting house with an unbearable stench, but none dared to turn their eyes away. Fear mixed with a cautious sense of relief. They called me a hero. But in those dark, empty hours, when sleep remained elusive, I knew that wasn't the whole story. In killing the Nagi Tanka, had I broken some delicate balance? Would the darkness merely take another shape, waiting out there under the pines, its eyes gleaming in the night? I started my day in the summer of 1978 at my grandparents' ranch in southern Colorado. They'd raised me since I was a baby and they were my whole world. The ranch covered hundreds of acres of dry grass, scrub oak, and rolling hills. Not exactly a bustling area, but it was home. Morning started at dawn with chores, and that day was no different. I remember it like it was yesterday. Grandpa Jonas was old school, didn't like to waste daylight. I still laugh. Grandpa never used an alarm. He had a rooster for that. Kiki Riki! That damn bird would start squawking at first light, right outside my window. That morning, though, it was silent. I remember feeling a bit uneasy, but figured the old rooster had slept in. I threw on my work clothes and boots, then headed out. It wasn't unusual to find Grandpa already in the barn, but he wasn't there. No Grandma Evelyn, either. I checked the house, nothing. Getting that cold feeling in the pit of your stomach the one that says something's wrong. I took off across the pasture towards the old sheep shed. The shed was a dilapidated thing, barely standing. We hadn't kept sheep in years. As I approached, a foul smell hit me. It took a moment to recognize it, blood and rotting meat. Dread pooled in my gut. The doors were closed. I braced myself, then shoved them open. The sight inside was out of a nightmare. There was Grandpa, or what was left of him, spread on the dirt floor. Blood covered everything. One arm was missing, gnawed to the bone at the shoulder. His eyes were open, staring blankly. Something shifted in the shadows, something big. I couldn't make it out right away, and like an idiot, I took a step closer. Then I saw them, eyes, 
glowing yellow in the dim light. Two sets. The beast in the corner lunged with an ear-splitting snarl, a blur of muscle and teeth. I stumbled back, my heart pounding so hard I thought it would burst. The other one circled, cutting off my escape. I never thought I'd know fear like that. My heritage, the old stories filled with creatures and spirits came rushing back. They weren't just tales. One of these things, some monster unseen for generations, had killed my grandpa. Adrenaline kicked in. I darted around the first creature and ran for the doors, shouting as loud as I could. I had a vague hope that someone else on the ranch might hear, or at least scare the things off. A heavy blow landed on my back. I slammed into the shed wall, the air bursting from my lungs. I didn't see what hit me, but I could hear snarling right behind me. The smell of rotten meat hung thick around me. My vision swam, my ribs throbbing. I couldn't fight, could just barely crawl. But Grandpa raised me tough. I wasn't about to die without a struggle. I rolled, desperate and hurting, and a glint caught my eye. An old pitchfork leaned against the wall. I grabbed the handle and swung blindly. Metal hit something solid, and a shriek echoed through the shed. One of the creatures went flying, crashing into wooden feed troughs. I was on my feet in an instant, heart pounding, body shaking. But I had a chance. The pitchfork was heavy, but anger and desperation fueled me. The creatures circled, keeping their distance. Maybe the one I'd hit was hurt. There was too much dimness, too much dust in the air, for me to see well. Whatever they were, they were cautious now. We held a strange standoff, the summer sun beating against the old shed, the stench of blood heavy in the air. I didn't know how long it lasted, a minute or an hour. I just knew I had to get out. Grandpa was gone, and as much as it tore my heart apart, I couldn't stay. Not if I wanted to live. These things had killed him. They'd kill me next. I tested one step back toward the doors, the pitchfork raised in trembling hands. The creatures tensed, but didn't move to attack. My eyes never left their burning yellow ones. I took another step back, and another, edging towards the light. A low growl echoed from somewhere behind me. Hey! My old friend Toby burst through the doors, rifle raised. Toby was a few years older and his family owned the ranch next to ours. Toby took in the scene with a shocked curse. The creatures, seeing someone new, bolted. Toby lifted the rifle, shooting one in the back as it disappeared into the tall grass. The other was already gone. In the sudden silence, it was like the whole world tilted. I could see Toby yelling something, but it sounded distant. My ears rang. He ran forward and grabbed me. I barely registered his words, the concern in his eyes. I just mumbled Grandpa's name over and over. Grandpa was gone. He was... Toby grabbed my shoulders, his eyes serious. Kianukai, listen. We gotta get you out of here. Come on. I got my truck. He pulled me towards the doors. I went numbly, stumbling against him. I had to get help. I had to tell someone. But part of me... A small, scared part that I tried to ignore just wanted to run and hide. Those creatures, those monsters from my ancestors' stories. They were real. And now, they had hunted down those I loved. We reached his battered old Chevy. Looking back at the shed, a strange feeling came over me. Something large was moving inside, dragging a heavy weight across the dirt floor. Then a shadow fell across the doorway, huge and misshapen. A limb glistening wetly reached out. Blood dripped from ragged claws. I tore my eyes away, not wanting to see any more. Toby shoved me into his truck and slammed the door shut. His voice was a distant murmur as he turned the key. We tore out of the pasture, dust flying behind us. As we bumped towards the two-lane highway, I saw it in the rearview mirror. A giant shape, moving with unnatural speed, bounding across the fields after us. The drive back to Toby's house was a blur. My head swam with shock and grief. My hands shook on the wheel, knuckles white. Toby, bless him, was a whirlwind of action. He shouted at his startled parents, demanded they call the sheriff, and got his dad's shotgun out of the closet. Those damn things, Mr. Johnson muttered, 
loading the gun. Used to be you only heard stories. Shut up, Dad, Toby snapped, eyes fixed on the road behind us. But they were right, weren't they? Stories. That's what the elders always said about the creatures that hunted in the shadows. Legends that faded, told to frighten disobedient children. And now, I couldn't breathe. Grandpa was dead, and it was my fault. I should have done something, woken him earlier, been more alert. Sheriff Hayes arrived, grim-faced and questioning. Toby's folks told the story while I stayed numb and silent, staring at nothing. They described the blood, the remains, the size and shape of the tracks. The sheriff listened, skeptical but not dismissive. There were reports of cattle mutilations in the area, things that couldn't be explained. Sounds like some kind of feral predator. Might be a bear that lost a paw, he said, frowning. Fury sparked in me. It wasn't a bear, damn it, I shouted, startling everyone. It was something else. A posse was formed. Old ranchers, Toby's dad, the sheriff armed with rifles. They wouldn't find anything. And if they did, they weren't prepared for what was out there. I had to do something. That night, after the men settled into a watchful camp away from our houses, I slipped into Toby's room. Where are you going? He whispered, sitting up in bed. Back to my place, I told him. There's something I have to do. You're crazy, he hissed. Those things nearly tore you apart. I nodded. I know, but Grandpa always taught me you have to finish what you start. He died because of me. I have to fix it. I didn't wait for a reply, just grabbed Grandpa's old revolver and some shells from the attic, then crept out the back door. It was dark, the moon only a sliver in the vast sky. The ranch seemed different, alien. Shadows moved with a life of their own. I walked, not towards the shed, but to Grandma's garden. The old stories whispered in my mind. Creatures like the ones that killed Grandpa. They had names powerful ones. Knowing a name could hold power over something, the elders said. I dug under the lavender bush, my fingers trembling, until I found the small bundle. Inside, wrapped in faded buckskin, was a necklace, a bear claw, a hawk talon, and a single strange stone that Grandma wore for protection. She said it was a gift from her father, from his father, passed down for generations. I took the necklace back to the shed. The smell of death lingered. I knelt by the drying pool of Grandpa's blood. The stone in my hand felt hot. I didn't know any prayers, only an old tale, the story of one like this. Na guayhe, I whispered in the silent night. The one who hunts in darkness, the eater of flesh, I call you out. Silence. My heart pounded so loud I could barely hear the crickets. I said it again, louder, fear turning into a wild kind of courage. The air changed. A chill ran down my spine, though the summer night was warm, rustling from the shadows and those yellow eyes blazing in the darkness. The creature stepped into the moonlight. It was huge, taller than any man, with long limbs and matted, filthy fur. Its head was like a wolf's, but bigger, twisted in a permanent snarl. It eyed me, hunger and intelligence in the glowing gaze. I know you. I said, keeping my voice steady. I know what you are. Na guayhe, you killed my grandfather. It ends now. The creature snarled and lowered itself into a crouch. I raised Grandpa's gun, aiming for the creature's chest. Then, as it lunged, I dropped the gun and held the necklace high. The strange stone flared a brilliant blue, a light so bright it hurt my eyes. The Na guayhe let out a deafening screech recoiling as if burned. It stumbled, then turned and ran, disappearing into the darkness. I staggered back, blinking away spots from the intense light. The stone was warm in my hand. I heard shouts in the distance, the search party alerted by the noise. In the days that followed, there were no more attacks. The sheriff's posse found a few dead coyotes, but nothing as large as what I'd described. Toby's dad claimed it was a rogue bear, finally dealt with, but they never found a carcass. 
I knew better. The ranch was quiet and sad without Grandpa and Grandma, and something inside me felt broken too. Toby, bless him, stuck by my side, but even his easy smile couldn't entirely chase away the shadows. A few weeks later, I packed my things. Toby drove me to the Greyhound station, hugging me tight before I boarded. I didn't know where I was going, just away. I took the necklace with me, the strange stone still warm in my pocket, a reminder of that terrible night. Some might say I lost everything that summer and they'd be right, but they'd also be wrong. It's hard to explain what it means to be forced to grow up in an instant, to see the world unveiled in its harshest truths. People call it bravery, facing a monster. Sometimes, though, I think real bravery is in facing what comes after. I spent some time in the Black Hills of South Dakota in 1991, always wanted to see the old sacred sites. My name's Tate. I was on my own, exploring. That was my thing back then. Didn't like to be tied down. The Lakota elders used to say there's something out there in those woods that the rest of the world has forgotten. And damn, they were right. Now I always considered myself an outdoorsman. I spent time hunting, worked on ranches in Wyoming when I was a kid. I never felt afraid out in the wild. The Black Hills, though, they were different. Beautiful, sure. But something about the shadows seemed to reach out at you, and the quiet. It was so heavy that it crushed down on your soul. One day I ventured deep on an old deer trail. I wanted to see what the old timers spoke of, those hidden valleys and sacred groves tucked away from prying eyes. The trail wound up through pine forests, thick and dark. I saw elk tracks, some bear scat already turning white in the sun, and once I swear I heard a distant howl that cut me to the quick. Still, I kept going that stubborn, adventurous streak dragging me along. Late in the afternoon, I came across a clearing, small, ringed by old pines. There was a strange stillness in the center, like the trees themselves were holding their breath. Right there, lying half-buried in the earth, was a huge skull. Not from anything I'd ever seen, like a deer maybe, but too massive, with antlers that curved up in a way that wasn't natural. Something told me to back off, but the morbid curiosity that gets the better of us all wouldn't let me. I got closer. I saw bones jutting up here and there, old and bleached, like a whole herd had died right in that spot. And as I stepped closer, I swear I felt the ground shift beneath my feet, just the slightest vibration, and the air crackled with a tension I couldn't explain. I should have listened to my instincts then and left, but I was drawn in. Then I saw them. Not all at once, but first the smell, and then, out of the tree line, a pair of eyes the size of dinner plates, shining in the low light. I backed up, my heart thundering against my ribs. The creature that emerged from the trees was enormous. It stood on two legs like a man, but was taller than any man, with broad shoulders and impossibly long arms dangling at its sides. Its skin was leathery, a mottled gray color and patches of coarse fur clung to its legs and chest. Its face, God that face, like a cross between a wolf and a man, but twisted, wrong with a snarling muzzle and those huge glowing eyes. I fumbled for the pistol I had on my hip, but I knew in my trembling bones it wouldn't do me much good. The creature didn't roar. It didn't rush at me. Instead, it tilted its head and stared. I felt stripped down to the bone under its gaze, as if it was studying me, evaluating me. It took a single, slow step forward. Instinct took over. I spun, fumbling through the trees, crashing through branches, scrambling up a rocky outcropping. Heart pounding, lungs burning, I risked a glance back. The clearing was empty, the creature nowhere to be seen. I didn't stop running until I found a road and flagged down a truck. The driver was a local rancher looked at me like I was crazy when I told him what I saw. Still, he gave me a ride into Rapid City. I booked a flight home the next day, never looked back. 
Sometimes you just know there are places men weren't meant to go. Things we weren't meant to see. I never spoke of that day, not in all these years. But it stayed with me. The clearing, the skull, and that monstrous figure in the trees. Some nights I can still feel its gaze on my back. I heard a story a few years ago from a young couple who went camping in the Black Hills. They found the body of a deer up in a tree, torn to shreds, hanging like some gruesome ornament. And the girl swore she heard the most inhuman wailing echoing through the night. They packed up and left the next morning and never went back. Smart kids. After a while, folks start to think you're crazy when you talk about monsters. So I mostly keep it to myself now. But I'll let you in on a secret. I saw something that day, something nobody could explain, something that makes me think twice about venturing back out into the wild alone. Some things, they're better left undiscovered, just like the old ones said. But a part of me, that scared, shivering part deep inside, wonders, was it really alone out there? How many more creatures like that could be lurking in the deep dark? Maybe it's watching even now, waiting, studying, maybe it knows. I grew up in the shadow of Mount Rainier, Washington, in the 1980s. My name is Salali, and even as a kid, I felt a connection to this place, an echo of my ancestors in the whispers of the wind through the evergreens. I spent days hiking with my dad, learning to track deer, watching eagles circle lazily above the snow-capped peaks. Dad was a park ranger, old school, believed the best way to protect these wilds was simply to know them inside and out. He loved his job, even though it didn't pay much. Then the logging companies came. Dad watched them tear into those untouched forests with cold fury in his eyes. I saw him start drinking more, getting short-tempered at home. It scared me. I was a scrawny kid, not tough, but I got stubborn about wanting to understand where that anger came from. So, while normal teenagers were playing Miss Pac-Man at the arcade, I pestered the tribal elders until they shared the old stories. It was their way, I suppose, of planting a seed. One story stuck with me. They said there was a spirit in the woods that the old ones called Tsemequis. They didn't worship it exactly, but treated it with respect, even a touch of fear. Huge and hairy, strong enough to uproot trees if it felt like it. Dad always said, Bigfoot's just a legend, but those old tales gave me chills. Then came the summer that changed everything. I was fifteen restless, and convinced Dad needed some cheering up after a particularly brutal battle with the loggers. I decided we were going to climb to the fire lookout on Granite Peak. Dad hadn't been up there for years. I made a big show of packing our old backpacks, and we set off early one morning, a bit of the old spirit back in his stride. The hike was hard, a relentless scramble up switchbacks that tested my scrawny legs. But Dad was in better spirits even pointing out a woodpecker drumming away high on a dead pine. We ate our lunch overlooking a sea of green that stretched all the way to the horizon. Pretty amazing sight for a city kid like me. That's when I saw the first sign, a set of footprints near an old campsite. Massive prints, way too big for a human. I froze, then looked at Dad. He was staring too. The grin wiped off his face. Can't be, he muttered but his voice was shaky. That was when we heard a noise, like a tree cracking, over by the ridge. Dad and I exchanged a look. He reached for the rifle he always carried, eyes narrowed. Something moved on the ridge, something massive and dark against the skyline. It looked like a silhouette of a giant gorilla hunched over, walking upright. We watched, hardly daring to breathe, until it disappeared back into the trees. It was clear as day, no hallucination. It was Tsemequis, or whatever else you want to call it, and it was real. My dad and I didn't talk much on the way down the mountain that day. Each of us wrapped up in our own thoughts. In the weeks that followed, things got weird. Dad kept taking me out into the woods on weekends. He wouldn't talk about what we saw, but he was focused, like a man on a mission. He tracked footprints, made plaster casts, always keeping his rifle close at hand. 
It made me nervous, like we were hunting something, not just watching it. Then, late one August night, Dad woke me up. Get dressed. Quiet as you can, he whispered, his eyes gleaming in the moonlight. We slipped out, hopped into his old truck, and drove for over an hour, deeper into the woods than I'd ever been. Finally, he stopped at the edge of a logging road, the moonlight glinting off the clear-cut stumps that stretched up a hillside like broken tombstones. He shouldered the rifle, flashlight cutting through the gloom. Stay close, he said, voice low. We started walking uphill, the ground uneven, branches whipping at our faces. The air was thick with the smell of cut pine. That's when it hit me. It was the same musky, animal scent I'd smelled near the footprints that first day on the peak. We went deeper. Suddenly, Dad stopped, raising a fist. I heard it too. A low grunt, a rustling. My knees turned to jelly, but Dad pulled me close, his grip on the rifle tightening. He flicked on his flashlight, beams slicing through the darkness. There, twenty feet away, was a pair of glowing eyes, yellow, like a cat's, fixed on us from within a thicket of saplings. It was crouched, hard to make out its exact shape in the shadows, but I knew, instantly and without the shadow of a doubt, that this was Chemequis. The creature let out a rumbling growl, exposing rows of long, sharp teeth. Dad slowly raised his rifle. I wanted to run, scream, melt into the forest floor, but I was held captive by those gleaming eyes. As my dad took aim, the thicket exploded. The creature erupted towards us with a terrifying bellow. My heart hammered in my chest like a trapped bird trying to break free. I shut my eyes tight, expecting the impact. But instead of pain and claws, I heard a gunshot, the sound echoing through the night. There was a roar of pain that cut off abruptly. When I dared to look, expecting to see dad sprawled on the ground, a different sight met my eyes. He stood firm, the rifle still smoking, his gaze fixed on the ground in front of him. And there, at his feet, was the massive slumped form of Chemequis, utterly still. I gaped, unable to make a sound. The creature that had loomed so large in the forest, in my nightmares, was dead. Dad lowered his rifle, his whole body seemed to slump with a weariness that was more than just physical exertion. It had to be done, he said, voice thick, his hand shaking as he fumbled for a cigarette. Numbly, I followed as he walked closer, the flashlight wobbling in my grip. Up close, the creature looked less monstrous and, shockingly, more familiar. There was thick hair matted with mud, yes, but under the dirt I could see a face that was disturbingly human in its structure. The yellow eyes were open, glazed in death, and in them I saw a reflection of both fear and loss. We didn't say much as we worked. Dad had rope in the truck, shovels, tarps. The logistics were grim, but carried out with a kind of grim efficiency I hadn't seen in him for years. By the time the first rays of dawn painted the sky gray, there was no trace of Tsemequis left, no blood, no sign of what had transpired on that logging road. We drove home in silence. Things changed for Dad after that night. Something settled in him, a heavy kind of peace. He quit drinking, started smiling more. When the loggers came, he argued his points based on clean water and forest health rather than rage. He still saw the forest as a place to protect but it was a kinder vision than before. He even started telling the old tribal stories at the community center, including the one about Semequis. At first, I figured he'd just lost it, gone nuts from the stress or the encounter. But then, one night months later, after I'd gotten my driver's license, we were driving home late. As we passed a familiar clear-cut, a shiver went down my spine. Dad saw it too, he pulled over to the side of the road and we got out, walking to the edge of the barren hillside. It was a clear night, the Milky Way like a river of diamonds across the sky. Dad cleared his throat. The stories talk about Semequis like it was some monster, but maybe... maybe we were the monsters all along. Dad, what happened that night? 
I asked, kneading the words out in the open. He didn't answer directly. Instead, he told me something else, about the old ways, the balance of things. He talked about how his people had always taken from the land, but also gave back. How Tzemequis, it wasn't something they hunted, it just was. A force, a spirit, and maybe a warning too. We forgot how to listen, Dad said, staring at the moonlit stumps as if they were ghosts. We cut and took without asking. That creature, maybe it was the last of its kind. Maybe it was angry, scared, the way a cornered animal turns dangerous. He looked at me with a pain in his eyes that mirrored my own. And maybe in the end, it saw no other way to protect what was left. We stayed there for a long time, neither of us talking, just breathing in the cool night air. The truth was sinking in. In our pursuit of that creature, driven by fear, anger, and maybe some twisted sense of scientific curiosity, we had become the very thing the elders tried to warn against. Dad never went back into those deep woods again. He spent the rest of his days as a ranger fighting the good fight, the legal fight, educating the next generation. As for me, the encounter never left me. I saw it in the rising tides, the choking smoke of wildfires and the receding glaciers on Rainier. I studied ecology in college, then environmental law. The fight changed form, but the core purpose was the same. Some nights I still dream of Tsimiquis, those yellow eyes burning in the dark. The old ones named it, but maybe they were naming a feeling, a primal fear rooted in the knowledge of the damage we were capable of inflicting upon the world. When I wake in a cold sweat, I remind myself that monsters aren't always born. Sometimes they're made. And sometimes, the only way to defeat the darkness is to confront the part of it that lives within ourselves. I grew up on the Navajo Reservation in northern Arizona, back in the 1970s. My name's Nathaniel TSO. Back then, there weren't a lot of jobs. People grew their own food, farmed, raised sheep for wool, the basics to get by. My older brother Samuel had gotten work with the railroad, one of the few good jobs available. Every other week, he'd send a bit of his earnings back home, and that kept our family going. One winter, it was particularly harsh. An unexpected snowstorm hit in late October, far too early for the season. Samuel had been due home, but we didn't hear a thing from him for longer than usual. Days stretched into weeks, and my father grew more worried with each passing storm. Dad wasn't much of a talker, so his fears sat heavy on his shoulders. The roads were impassable, and we were getting low on supplies. I finally volunteered to try and find Samuel, or at least send word back that we were all right. My father reluctantly agreed bundled me up in every spare blanket he owned, and I headed out on horseback. I knew the route Samuel usually took, dirt paths through the canyons, a good four days ride on a strong horse. The snow had started to melt just slightly, so getting through the first few passes wasn't too treacherous. I tried to pick up Samuel's trail, but the weather had done its best to hide any sign of his travels. By the third day, I was exhausted, and the snow was starting to come down hard again. I was about to give up and turn around when I saw it, an old abandoned miner's shack off in the distance. It looked like my best chance for shelter until the storm passed. I managed to urge my weary horse toward it, and we took refuge inside. The shack was a single room, mostly empty. I built a fire with the meager sticks I'd gathered outside and tried to warm myself by the meager flames, conserving my little store of food. I knew I had to get home soon tell Dad I hadn't found Samuel. That's when the noises started, scrabbling against the old tin roof, a low guttural growl unlike any animal I'd ever heard. My horse started skittering nervously, and I realized we weren't alone. I moved to the narrow window and peered out through the swirling snow. It was massive, at least seven feet tall at the shoulder, 
with gleaming black fur that seemed to absorb what little light filtered through the storm. Its eyes glowed a fiery yellow, reflecting back the flames of my campfire. It had claws like daggers, each one the length of my hand. Fear twisted in my belly. I'd heard the stories as a boy, whispers of some creature haunting these parts, but I dismissed them as myths, old tales meant to keep children away from the canyon cliffs. This, this was real, right there outside the shack. I grabbed my rifle, the one my father had taught me to shoot as a child, and tried to steady my trembling hands. But what could a rifle do against such a beast? The growling intensified as though it knew I was armed. I watched as the creature stalked back and forth outside the shack, scraping its claws against the walls and letting loose those spine-chilling howls. I knew I shouldn't have made a fire. The smoke and light were attracting it, making us both easy targets. But the shack offered no other source of heat. The firewood was damp, refusing to catch. If I didn't keep the fire going, I'd freeze to death before the storm let up. My horse whinnied, breaking the tense stillness. I stroked its mane, whispering words of comfort I wasn't sure either of us believed. We were trapped, the fire both our lifeline and a beacon for the monstrous thing out there. Hours passed as the storm raged on. Through it all, those terrible growls filled the air. Several times I saw its glowing eyes pressed against the gaps in the wallboards, as though it were trying to get a clear look inside. Just when I thought my nerves would crack, the growling faded. I crept to the window, heart pounding. The snowstorm was starting to ease and dawn's pale light was breaking through the clouds. The creature, whatever it was, had retreated. Exhausted but relieved, I waited until it was fully light out before risking another peek out the window. No sign of it. My horse was as restless as I was, so I finally saddled up, leaving the rest of my supplies behind. Better to face the cold than stay there one more night with the knowledge of what lurked outside. I made it home at dusk that same day. I choked out the story to my father, my voice still shaking. I could tell he didn't quite believe me. The elders had told tales of a skinwalker, a malevolent witch with the ability to shapeshift into animals, but never anything like I'd seen. Even I would have doubted my own eyes if I hadn't been there myself. Samuel was never found. We always wondered if it was the storm that got him, or something far worse. After that, I kept my story to myself. No one needs to know the terrors lurking in the corners of the world, out there waiting where the shadows are deepest. The rest of that winter, we stayed close to home. My father never let me travel alone again, not even when the snow had long since melted away. I never set foot in that canyon again, and those fiery eyes haunt my nightmares even now. Some nights, lying in bed, I hear the wind whistling through the eaves, and for a moment, a terrified part of me thinks it's a low, menacing growl. Even now, all these years later, I make sure the curtains are drawn tight as the sun begins to set. There are things in this world. Monstrous things. I saw one, and it changed me forever. For the past few weeks, folks in the neighboring town have been whispering about missing hikers. They say there were tracks, huge and unidentifiable. I know better than to voice my fears, but deep down, a cold dread pools in my stomach. I tell myself they'll never come as far south as the reservation, that I'm safe here on familiar ground. But some nights, when the fire crackles low and the wind whispers just a little too loud, I'm not so sure. I start to hear scratching against the window pane and try to convince myself it's just a branch scraping against the glass. The other night, I bolted awake, certain I saw two fiery eyes glowing through the slit in the curtains. My horse had been restless all day, and as I rushed to the window, a low growl rumbled through the darkness. Maybe it's just my imagination playing tricks on me. Maybe. But as I write this, I can't shake the feeling. The image of those eyes kept me awake for nights. I started keeping my rifle loaded, the old hunting knife Dad gave me within easy reach. But I also knew avoiding the canyons wasn't a long-term solution. We needed supplies. 
A week later, a desperate resolve settled over me. I couldn't let fear cripple us. Gathering my warmest clothes, I informed my father that I was heading out for a hunt, anything to replenish our stores. He looked at me, worry etched on his face, but didn't protest. We both knew it was necessary. This time, I took a different, longer route, skirting the canyon as much as I could. It would take longer, but I hoped it would keep me safe. The first two days were uneventful, a bit of snowshoe hair and some dried berries, enough to get by. But as the third day dawned, a sense of unease prickled at the back of my neck. I felt eyes on me. I kept turning my head, scanning the trees, searching for anything out of place. Nothing. I told myself it was just nerves, leftover fear from my last trip, but that chilling sensation only intensified. That evening, I settled into a small clearing surrounded by dense pines. I knew it wasn't ideal, limiting my line of sight, but the trees offered some shelter from the wind. My meager campfire crackled as I gnawed on some jerky, the gnawing anxiety in my gut far more powerful than physical hunger. I tried to distract myself, thinking about home and the family waiting for me, but the images of those glowing eyes kept intruding. Just as I drifted into an uneasy sleep, a noise jolted me awake, a branch snapping, too heavy to be an animal. I bolted upright, rifle in hand, scanning the edge of the clearing. There it was again, a rustle in the bushes, a movement just at the edge of the firelight. I aimed, my voice cracking as I shouted, Who's there? Show yourself! Silence. My heart pounded in my ears. Had I imagined it? Then a voice, deep and rumbling, rolled out from the darkness. Nathaniel TSO. My breath hitched. It knew my name. Leave this place, the voice continued. This is my land. I stumbled back tripped over a fallen log. Who are you? What are you? The creature didn't answer, but the bushes rustled again, growing closer. My finger trembled on the trigger. Fear clawed at my throat, my logical mind screaming at the impossibility of the situation and yet the very real threat in front of me. Suddenly, it charged out of the darkness. For a heart-stopping moment, it was fully illuminated by the flames. Taller even than I remembered, its fur was a patchwork of black and dark gray, matted and ragged as if it hadn't cleaned itself in years. Its muzzle was long and pointed, revealing jagged teeth that gleamed in the firelight. It walked on its hind legs, but its forelimbs were enormous, tipped with those same terrifying claws. This was no bear, no mutated beast. This, this was something else. I fired. One shot, then another. It roared a deafening sound that echoed through the trees, but the bullets seemed to have no effect. The creature advanced, a look of pure fury contorting its monstrous face. Desperation propelled me. I dropped the rifle and grabbed the hunting knife, a paltry defense but all I had left. The creature lunged. I barely dodged, the force of its attack knocking me to the ground. The knife went flying. It snarled, lunging forward again and this time everything seemed to move in agonizing slow motion. It was too fast, too powerful. I closed my eyes, bracing for the impact, but there was only a whimper and the thud of something heavy hitting the ground. I opened my eyes. The creature was gone. Cautiously, I stood, my heart slamming against my ribs. A figure lay hunched on the ground by the tree line. My father. There was blood, bright against the snow, soaking his coat. I stumbled over, my knees buckling as I reached him. His breath rattled in his chest, his eyes squeezed shut in pain. Dad, I choked out, my voice raw. What? Why are you here? He coughed, more blood spattering on the snow. Followed you, he gasped, his breaths ragged. Saw the tracks. Knew. I pressed my hand to his wound, trying to stop the bleeding but it was useless. I knew it, and he knew it too. Those claws. It was a death wound. His eyes rolled open, fixing on me. Run, he croaked. Save yourself. I shook my head, tears streaming down my face. I can't. I won't leave you. He reached up, a shaking hand cupping my face. Son, his voice was barely a whisper now. 
Listen. Thing. Not from here. Not natural. Old legends. Call it Na'aldlushi. Na'aldlushi? I repeated, confusion warring with the crushing grief threatening to swallow me whole. I'd never heard that name before. Evil. Unstoppable, he whispered, then coughed, gasping for breath. Dad, please. My voice broke, a desperate plea. His hand fell away and his eyes glazed over. Run. He breathed one last time, and then the light left his eyes. Numb with shock, I stayed by his side. The fire crackled, casting ominous shadows. The creature, the Na'aldlushi, was out there, watching, waiting. But leaving meant abandoning my father, and I couldn't bear it. As the long night wore on, I made a decision. A crazy one, born of grief and fury. I wasn't just going to run. I was going to end this. Dawn streaked the sky with pale gray as I dragged my father's body to the clearing. Working quickly, I dug a shallow grave using the hunting knife, my hands barely functioning from the bitter cold, but driven by a desperate need to honor him, to give him some semblance of rest. It was a pitiful offering in the frozen ground. As I lay his body down, a choked sob escaped my throat. I covered him with a blanket, piling rocks on top to protect him from scavengers, and whispered a traditional prayer, asking for his spirit to find peace. Then, exhaustion and sorrow nearly crushing me, I fell into a restless sleep beside his grave, the rifle tucked under my arm. I awoke with a start. The sun was higher in the sky, and there was a noise, not the wind, but a methodical crunching in the snow. My eyes flew open and I scrambled to my feet, scanning the clearing for the creature. It was there, its back to me, crouched over something. My something. Rage exploded within me, a blinding fury that drowned out every instinct of self-preservation. It had taken my father, it had stalked and terrorized me for weeks, and now I charged, a guttural cry tearing from my throat. It turned just as I reached it, a snarl starting and then dying on its lips. Surprise flickered across its monstrous face, and for a moment, the sheer primal anger I saw reflected in its own eyes gave me pause. It dropped what it held and lunged at me, claws outstretched. I dodged, more instinct than training, and brought the rifle butt down as hard as I could. The blow glanced off its shoulder, eliciting a roar of pain. I fired, aiming not to kill, but to hurt, to drive it away. The bullet tore through its leg and it stumbled. I wasn't done. Fueled by grief and fury, I attacked with a wildness the creature clearly hadn't expected. I swung the rifle, bashed it against its snout, kicked at its wounded leg, screamed, and cursed at it. The Na'aldlushi, surprised by this sudden ferocity, seemed to hesitate. Confusion clouded those burning eyes. Not fear, exactly, but something akin to it. Then, with another roar that shook the trees, it turned. It ran, limping into the dense undergrowth and leaving a crimson trail in the snow. I sank to my knees, trembling, the rifle slipping from my grasp. I had done it. I had faced the monster and, maybe not defeated it, but driven it back. That day... I made a solemn vow beside my father's grave. I would learn about this creature. I would hunt it down, not for vengeance, but for the safety of the people here. That was my responsibility, my burden to bear. Returning to the reservation was bittersweet. Everyone grieved with me for my father, sharing whispers of something monstrous lurking out there, just out of sight. The elders spoke of the old stories but offered little concrete advice. I knew my path lay outside those stories, outside tradition. I enlisted the help of two of my cousins, Jake and Ben, telling them bits and pieces of what I'd seen and lived through. They were young, open-minded enough not to scoff, and eager to help. We started small, learning basic hunting and tracking techniques, studying animal behavior, I told them the Na'aldlushi wasn't like any ordinary creature and watched as they came to accept something out there that defied logic. It took months, but we eventually found its tracks near the canyon where I had first encountered it. 
huge misshapen prints that resembled nothing I'd ever learned to identify. We started setting traps, primitive at first, snares and pits meant to slow it down, not kill it directly. We needed, I needed, answers. I refused to believe this creature was some kind of demon or spirit. There was a logical explanation, something twisted and terrible, but something born from this world. Then, a year after my father's death, my cousins found something. A trail of hair, a bit of tattered skin caught on a low-hanging branch, leading to what looked like a cave half concealed by scrub brush and fallen rocks. We laid low, watching for any sign of movement. Days passed, a tense weight that only solidified my resolve. It was here, injured perhaps, but still dangerous. Finally, we saw it emerge, a lumbering figure, thinner, its legs still showing the limp from my gunshot. We followed, cautious, methodical. The cave was surprisingly deep, the passageway narrow and dark. My cousins had brought flashlights, but I kept mine off, not wanting to give our position away. The passageway opened up into a wider cavern. A flicker of light up ahead told us something was there. We crept closer, and then gasped in unison. Fire. A small, sputtering campfire weakly illuminated the cave, and huddled by the flames, thin and skeletal, was a man. A man with ragged clothes, long matted hair, and those same terrible glowing eyes. I froze. This was not an animal, not some demonic force. This was a human being, transformed into the creature I knew as the Naaldlushi. The tales had been wrong all along. As we stood there, transfixed, the figure snarled, reaching for something on the ground, a spear crudely fashioned from bone. The fight wasn't over. My cousins started forward, weapons drawn, but I held them back. I had seen enough death. Backing away slowly, I led them out of the cave, leaving the monstrous man behind. In the days that followed, I couldn't bring myself to tell my cousins the truth of what I had found. Instead, we sealed the cave entrance, hoping to keep it contained, then spread the word through the reservation of a dangerous animal in the canyons, one to be avoided at all costs. The Naald Lushi sightings eventually ceased. Life returned to a semblance of normalcy. We never spoke of the man, the truth of it all. Perhaps it was a mercy. Ignorance for everyone was better than shattering the fragile peace we had. But I carry the knowledge, a heavy burden. I learned there is darkness in this world, darkness that can wear a human face. And sometimes our greatest enemy is not the unknown, but ourselves. <laughs>